Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. This is a podcast that explores topics relevant and related to psychedelic culture, medicine, and research, and always with the underlying question of how can we work with and through our psychedelic experiences to become better people, not just for ourselves, but for all those with whom we are nested in relationship, presently and across time, human and non-human alike. I am your host, as always, James W. Gesso, and with each episode, we present a long-form, unedited conversation with a guest. The guest for this episode is Dr. Adele LaFrance, and we're going to explore love. Uh, love and psychedelics, love and healing, healing and psychedelics, and a number of uh, sort of related topics. Like any episode, I have a little overture here that I'll read prior to the beginning uh, of the actual interview, uh, which you can also read in the uh, show notes to this episode at jameswgesso.com. Here we go. Where is the love? One of the most prevailing and significant elements of a profound psychedelic journey is often an encounter with an all-encompassing force of love, like love with a capital L. However, love is not discussed much in the overall psychedelic research and medicine landscape. Instead, they talk of connectedness, oceanic boundlessness, unconditional positive regard, self-acceptance, self-compassion, etc. These are all elements and aspects of love, but they aren't necessarily love. Now, there are good reasons to discuss these elements of a psychedelic experience and not use the L word from misunderstandings to misuses and even abuses of power dynamics. However, the fact remains that love is there. And if we are to truly understand and learn the lessons our psychedelic encounters with love are offering us, we need to accept the challenge of looking love right in the beautiful face. Thankfully, Dr. Adele LaFrance is on the scene. Dr. Adele LaFrance is a clinical psychologist, research scientist, author, and developer of emotion-focused family therapy. She is also a leader in the research and practice of psychedelic medicine with a focuses on ayahuasca, MDMA, psilocybin, and ketamine. Currently, she is the clinical investigator and strategy lead for the MAPS-sponsored MDMA-assisted psychotherapy study for eating disorders and a collaborator slash clinical support for the Imperial College study of psilocybin and anorexia nervosa. Dr. LaFrance is also the founding member of the Love Project, which is essentially a research project exploring experiences of encountering love while well, under the influence of psychedelics. This is a survey-based research. The survey is still presently open, so if you've had such an experience, please do consider uh, participating in that survey if you'd like to contribute to psychedelic research. There's a link in the description of this episode. We'll talk more about it in the interview, and I'll mention it again at the end. Um, but to suffi suffice to say, uh, the Love Project is a significant contributor to why Dr. LaFrance is even on the show today, because it is a beautiful and interesting project. But that all said, um, our conversation begins with an exploration of emotional processing and how difficulties and deficiencies in emotional processing affect our mental health, our relationships, and our general well-being. From there, we step into psychedelics and the role psychedelics play in supporting our emotional processing capacities. After that, we turn directly towards love what it is and all the accidental ways we conflate it with things that can include love but aren't love itself, such as romance, lust, infatuation, attachment, obsession, etc. We talk about the healing power of love both in our day-to-day -day lives and in various forms of healthcare, and why as a society we need to better learn how to wield and integrate that healing power of love. We then talk about encounters with love as a transpersonal force during psychedelic experiences, the role of love in supporting people in their psychedelic experiences, such as the role of a guide or facilitator or therapist, and even the strange phenomenon of being harmed by too much love on 5-MeO DMT. Of course, love itself is not sex, but with any mention of love, we evoke consideration of sexuality, sexual dynamics, and sex itself. Thus, we also talk about sexual healing, the complexity of sexual energy and behavior in therapy, and even the risk, challenges, and opportunities of having sex while on psychedelics. So that's the overture, and that's a little sense of what you're getting into today if you choose to continue listening from here 
into the interview with Dr. Adele LaFrance. Before we get into that interview, a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon, including the people who are listed on the screen here on YouTube or in the description to this episode. As uh, if it wasn't for the voluntary financial involvement of my patrons, I would not be able to do and put the full-time work into the larger body of work and research regarding psychedelics, of which this podcast is a part. So thank you very much. If you're not yet a patron and you'd like to follow uh, my work, you can sign up to follow me on Patreon without becoming a paying member, or you could also become a paying member of my Patreon community by heading to patreon.com forward slash James to be Gesso. I'm sure basically all of you now, if you're listening to podcasts, have a sense of how Patreon works. So I'll leave that, uh, leave that alone for this particular episode, but I will thank you in advance for, uh, for signing up. Um, financially or otherwise. Um, and if you'd like to just leave a one-time donation and not necessarily sign up for the Patreon, there are links in the description of this episode with options for you to do so, including PayPal. Okay, so that's all for the intro. Uh, please enjoy my interview with Dr. Adele LaFrance here on Adventures of the Mind. Dr. Adele LaFrance, welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. Thank you so much, James. I'm really, really happy to be here. Uh, I'm also happy that you're here. Uh, one of the central things we're going to talk about today is something that is, uh, I'd say, like um, almost uh, intrinsic to the psychedelic experience, and yet simultaneously widely under discussed in the larger research field of psychedelics, which is, of course, love. Uh, but before we get into that, you're uh, the founder of emotion focused family therapy. And a part of that therapy specifically uh, pertains to basically difficulties in emotional processing. So the first question is not so much about the therapy itself. That's just kind of a reference. But the question is more, you know, tell me a little bit about emotions, emotional processing, and emotional processing difficulties and how it might affect our lives and our mental health? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a huge question and one that we have gained some traction on over the last, I would say, 50 years. So we've come to learn that emotions are uh, essential signaling systems that let us know uh, what we need more of or less of in our lives. They support survival, both physical survival, but also psychological survival. But... Um, over the, I don't know how long um, it's debatable, we have um, been disconnected from our emotions, and I would say our instincts as well, of which emotions are part of actually the instinct system. And there are different reasons why we've been disconnected from our emotional system. One of them definitely is historical trauma. Um, if we think about like World War II, for example, uh, the people who were on the front line, it, you know, it wasn't a good idea for them to be connected to their sadness, connected to their fear or their shame responses. They needed to suppress it. But when the war was over and they went home, no one said to them like, hey, FYI, good idea to suppress for that, you know, acute period of time. But now really, really important for you to feel those feelings. Otherwise, you are likely to become overrepresented in the homeless population, in prisons, or um, uh, struggle with addiction behaviors, uh, or all kinds of other problematic, you know, uh, behaviors, including a diagnosis of PTSD. And there are other historical traumas that have occurred that have really disconnected people from their signaling system. Um, I think about what it's been like for oppressed people you know, who have been targeted, marginalized, if they, ex if there are some groups of people in North America where if they express anger, they're more likely um, to have their lives be at risk, you know, than other groups of, of people. I think about black men in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say you know? being shot by police. <laughs> yeah, Exactly. And so there are historical traumas, past, current, that have interrupted our capacity to connect with our emotional system, um, you know, in a, in a reliable way. And um, for some people, unfortunately, those conditions endure and they are safe, safe or safer spaces, uh, but not totally safe. And the 
problem when we're talking about mental health issues is if your emotional system either isn't, um, I would say, working properly, if there are some glitches in the system, or we're not attending to the system, then we do actually become more at risk of developing mental health issues, including depression, including anxiety, including an eating disorder or um, uh, problematic substance use. And among all the factors that contribute to mental health issues developing, including intergenerational factors, including cultural, um, political factors, if we target and transform emotion processing deficits in safe or safer spaces, then that is a way that we can help people get relief um, from suffering. Advocacy is important, you know, um, working on so social messaging is important and we need to we need to kind of link arms and continue to move forward with those agendas. But something that we can target today in this moment is our emotional system. We can bring health to our emotional system immediately. You know, emotions are easily activated. They're easily worked through in safer, safer settings. And there's a connection between emotions and memories that's quite fascinating. Like we can call up memories that have emotion tags attached to them and maybe uh, emotion tags that are, that are really distressing. And we can like work through or clean those emotion tags so that when the memory gets restored, so does our sense of self, perhaps, or so does our sense of safety, perhaps, or so does our capacity for self-compassion. So there's, it's, it's such a fascinating world, in my opinion, like the working with emotions to help restore a sense of balance, to reconnect to wholeness. Um, and it's a factor that is transdiagnostic. And so it can affect all kinds of expressions of stress and distress, and it can also affect um, overall health and well-being. Hmm. Now, you use two two sort of like extreme examples, right? You use the example mm -hmm. of uh, coming back from one of the world's wars, which is like among the most devastating things that humanity has wrought upon itself and the planet, you know, and then mm -hmm. also a, a rather extreme example of, of systemic racial oppression. But right. from what I understand, it's not just people who go through these extreme circumstances that get dysfunctional emotional processing and then end up in these sort of like we'll say clinical outcomes but that we as a as a as a species at this time or at least when i say we the you know the cultural identity yeah. that i can best you know identify with which is the one yeah. that i was brought up in which is like a you know dominant culture of north america is that there's a there's just like a fundamental illiteracy to emotions period yeah. but then also processing our emotion our emotions in a healthy way so can you talk a little bit about what this might look like in just the day-to-day -day life of being a human being and how we interact and relate and perceive circumstances and others um, throughout yeah. the course of our day in ways that aren't diagnose uh diagnosable as right. clinical right. ptsd or whatever yeah, I, well, I think that actually the big events have trickled down to affect the everyday person's functioning because um, it changed the way cultural norms of emotional expression were communicated through generations, um, fueled by these survival fears, you know. And so what we have now are, um, and there are some gender differences still that I expect will continue to be washed out as the concept of gender evolves in our culture, you know, but, um, currently we're still seeing so many men who feel like the expression of vulnerability is far too risky, far too dangerous. And therefore they end up communicating their stress or distress in ways that are problematic for themselves, for others. And then, um, women, and there's a whole political history related to this, have been conditioned to um, to not have anger. I mean, they have anger, but to to deny it, to disallow it, and certainly not to express it. And I'm talking about healthy anger, assertive anger, empowered anger, you know? And so when we deny vulnerability 
we're far more likely to develop um, secondary or unhealthy uh, aggression or anger. When we deny healthy anger, we're far more likely to develop processes of anxiety or low mood or feelings of worthlessness. Um, and so really, it's so it can be so simple. If you're the type of person who's a bit more edgy when stressed or in distress, or you're the type of person who does a bit more of a collapse when stressed or in distress, then it's kind of a simple test to see uh, what emotion didn't work for you or for your lineage um, that you ended up not you know, losing access to to some degree. Like a self-critic, for example. So many people have self-critics with or without you know, a diagnosable mental health condition. And, and they're really, really hard to live with. And oftentimes the root of that self-critic is a recognition that the environment, and not just the familial environment, but the greater environment, isn't available to respond to our emotional system. And therefore, we have to make ourselves wrong to uh, make it easier or more tolerable to navigate life, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. And I, I want to I wanna go back a minute there about uh, you sort of delineated the, you know, the gender differences in, in uh, emotional conditioning between men and women. And, and I think the latter point that you brought up around, uh, you know, are you more likely to become agitated and, you know, explode out or become sort of like internalized and shut down? I feel mm -hmm. like to me, I find this to be you know, maybe a, a more clear cut way of thinking about it, especially from, a, you know, a growing understanding of, 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 of uh, gender representation is that sure, it is likely there's a lot of history around male violence coming out of expressions of rage, which has to do with anger being one of the few emotions that they're allowed to feel. Mm -hmm. um, but so too is their suppression of anger, because the reality is, is that, you know, society does recognize male anger, be it rage or not, as being something that is considered as violent or problematic or an issue. And mm -hmm. same to be said that, you know, women, from what I understand, are generally more likely to be conditioned to shut down and, you know, uh, you know, sa sacrifice themselves, not sacrifice in a proper or honorific way, but sacrifices right. in a, a compromising kind of way. Yeah. But that by no means suggests that women by default are less likely to fly off in rage and violence out of anger. Um, mm -hmm. And that I, I think this clarification around this sort of what I've heard as a, um, as it, uh, this is going into uh, attachment styles, but like anxious or avoidant, like, are you more likely to, you know, freak out onto the world? Or are you more likely to internalize and freak out onto yourself? Feels mm -hmm. like a, like maybe a little bit more modern way of understanding without wanting to let go of the fact that, you know, I, th I think a portion, a portion of that, of that male inclination towards anger maybe is that, uh, there's a greater representation in the sort of like, um, the, the masculine gendered people to suppress sadness as well. Um, mm -hmm. and of course mm -hmm. a great way to suppress sadness is to get angry. Um, that's generally what they learn. Um, but mm -hmm. it's, it feels important not to just like make it seem as though it's so clear cut and that there's oh, actually, gosh. you know, yeah. Totally. And it's, and it really depends on, uh, the society in which you grew up and mm -hmm. like, and we can talk about society with d different concentric circles, sure. and are, the family and, within the society. And yeah. that's right. Exactly. The family culture, the family history of trauma and, you know, people forget about, you know, if you, if you identify as male or female or non-binary people who struggle with the expression of, what's considered scientifically or neurochemically an adaptive emotion are likely going to experience stress or distress in other areas of their life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially in our relationships, you know, if I, what, one of the other things is, 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 you know, if I have a difficulty processing a particular emotion as a consequence of an unaddressed wound from my past, or just a general pattern of uh, of, of, of emotional expression and and um, response based in my upbringing, mm -hmm. and that emotion is triggered by a circumstance, well, like you said, these memories are associated with that emotion tag. There's a very good chance that without knowing it, I'm going to project onto the scenario, onto the person, a bunch of my yes. unaddressed stuff from yes. the past. And that becomes very muddied because 
even if I'm being triggered into something, like that's okay. It's okay to be triggered. The challenge is like how to then divorce that from the person it's being projected upon, own it, and then do so in a way that allows us to to process it in a healthy way and learn different things without making yes. others responsible for our pasts, while also being able to differentiate when it is that that other person generally did a thing that That's elicited right. a certain set of emotions and that you know represents a violation in the of the relational contract whatever it might be and it requires you know conflict resolution address and resolved and in conversation so i think there's just like just adding in how exactly. complex this web of emotional processing yes. is and how integrated it is into every aspect of our lives in fact, I recorded a YouTube video to help people work through triggers in the way that you just described. And so I don't know if it's possible to add it in the show notes, but it's a free, you know, YouTube video that it's seven minutes and it helps people work it through so that by the end, they can uh, re-engage with that scenario or the person who, who uh, may have triggered them in a, it, with clarity, you know, so, and including tending to an old wound if necessary. So yeah, I love that you just like literally described it so perfectly because that is the point, you know, that is the point. Our, we all have baggage. We're all going to have baggage for the rest of our lives. You know, we're human. We're not super efficient with baggage. Um, but if we can have less baggage and if our baggage can interfere less with our capacity to be present and to be connected in the world with ourselves, with other people, then uh, that's a worthy effort. Mm. Well, maybe maybe that's a good segue into uh, into psychedelics, and you know this into psychedelics. Wow, like uh, old growth forest of life just opened up before us. So complex. Uh, where do we go? But specifically with respect to your perspective on where. Ooh, even if I say psychedelics, you know, the role that they might play in supporting, you know, not only emotional processing difficulties in the actual processing itself, but also in the learning of new ways to process of emotion. But by even saying that, I'm sort of, uh, I'm invoking the sort of clinical something. And there's so many other ways to be working with psychedelics outside of the clinic. So I'm, I'm assuming you're going to speak more from a clinical perspective, uh, which is fine, but you could clarify that. Um, but the question is generally, you know, where do you see psychedelics, the role of psychedelics or psychedelic journeying or therapy um, with respect to these emotional processing difficulties? Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge, very strong supporter of empowering uh, personal use initiatives. And so I'm happy to speak about my experiences, both clinically, but also uh, non-clinically. Um, uh, there are all kinds of barriers for access, you know, in terms of like clinical uh, access to medicines uh, that are visible and invisible. And so here in Colorado, where I, where I live, personal use is now legal. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. So I'm happy to speak from both perspectives. But um, so I worked, I have a psychologist and I've been working as a psychologist with a specific focus on emotions and emotion processing for many, many, many years um, now. And when I was first introduced to psychedelics, you know, I was lucky to have uh, quite a significant kind of um, file folder, you could say, or filing cabinet of emotion theory. And so when that filing cabinet of an emotion theory kind of collided with my experience, my early experiences with psychedelics, I was like, this is an incredible match. I mean, I, it really was just so astounding to me that what I was learning about emotion theory and emotion transformation theory was coming to life through psychedelics so quickly and so creatively. And I thought, okay, this is it, you know, and I mean, it, I mean, this is it, like, this is a pathway that I would like to follow for the rest of my career, because I see so much potential either as a form of healing and growth or as an adjunct to more conventional models of healing and growth. And the concept of the inner healing intelligence, it took me a while to get it, you know, theoretically, but then when I, I experienced it, I'm like, oh my gosh, this memory 
that I had that I have inside of an early um, sexual assault that I had worked on in therapy, like it was not done. And just allowing the fear to arise. And then once the fear passed, then that healthy anger, you know, that wasn't able to be expressed was like next in line, just as emotion theory would have predicted, you know, and, and I see it often in clinical studies, but also outside of clinical studies, where, for example, people will be in the depths of despair and psychedelic elicited despair is like not fun no (laughs) (laughs) definitely not as a no as a non-specific amplifier i mean people run away from their feelings of despair already you know but then you amplify it and reliably if you stick with despair in the context of a psychedelic journey what will come through is what um some of the early psychologists talked about is that that intrinsic like vitality of like, I am worthwhile. My life is important. I deserve. And it's so cool because I, I teach in some of the psychedelic therapy programs. It's so cool because er, like a new therapist or guides, you know, are a little bit nervous about diving into hopelessness, like feeling it more, but it's like, no, 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 do it. It's like the Phoenix rising from the ashes. You hang out in the ashes of despair and these little bubbles of vitality, of health that have been covered up, you know, for so long start to emerge. And so, I mean, I just love psychedelics as a tool for emotion. I could talk forever about it, you know, like reconnecting people to sacred anger, reconnecting people to the medicine of grief, which by the way, our indigenous brothers and sisters and siblings and grandmothers and grandfathers have been telling us for years and years and years, like, Grief is such a potent medicine. Um, And so there's something about psychedelics that makes it feel more okay. It makes us feel more resourced, addressing or leaning into either challenging emotional states or memories that are tagged, you know, with challenging emotional states. Yeah. You know, this, this, you know, the, the model or the sort of conceptual lens of emotions and emotional processing as a, as as a, as a means to understand sort of what we're going through in a psychedelic experience really like the most uh, the most sort of com- verifiably real uh aspect of an emotion of a psychedelic experience is the emotions we're feeling like there's all sorts of other things that are happening and implications and perceptions and visions and metaphors and all the concepts and all sorts of things that, you know, I can, I'm not going to say are or are not more or less real, but they definitely are on the shiftier ends. But what we're feeling at any given oh. time, undeniably, uh, you know, a, a, a good concrete foundation in a way to understand uh, what it is that we were going through, what was happening during yeah. those experiences. This is why, and I I recognize that in the on the clinical scene, I don't get a lot of don't get a lot of play, probably because I didn't have any uh, letters at the end of my name when I did it. But mm-hmm. this is why when I wrote "Decomposing the Shadow" and released it mm, now over ten years ago, the entire process of it was talking about how emotions or how psilocybin mushrooms assist us in our emotional processing and how much so much of our mental health issues our result of stuck emotional processes that psilocybin can help us resolve. And the consequence when integrated is that we can then take the energy now liberated from all the suppression or yes. distortions and apply it into, you know, different, what was the terms I use like a, to fertilize the spiritual sapling or something of our, of our lives or something oh God, to this effect. Yes. Right. So, so it's, it's beautiful to hear that, um, to hear you speaking to that as well. Of course, that's, uh, a foundational way to look at it now, uh, 10 years later, I'm happy that I had some contribution. If not, it's entirely recognized by those up in the oh echelons I'm of sorry. academia. I'm so sorry <laughs> That's okay. on behalf of the academic world. Sometimes the blinders that we have really, really limit us to the gems that are available, you know, um, in people like you and in other cultural traditions. And so I really, and I have to say like, 
I had my own internal revolution where I was very blinded to what other traditions had to offer or other non-academic people had to offer. And so I'm finally awake to the ignorance of that. And so I'm glad that you're speaking uh, to it specifically. Yeah. Mm. Well, I appreciate you saying that. It might not, it might come off as seeming I'm bitter. I'm not, you know, even at the time, that's not what I was writing it for. I wasn't writing it for the scientists. I was writing it for the people who were using mushrooms and might not understand why it is that they weren't getting any results or were getting themselves hurt or weren't able to access something that they didn't realize was available to them. So that was the whole purpose. It wasn't, it wasn't for the upper echelons. It was for the rest of us. Um, so moving on now, I want to put a, put a pin in the psychedelic discussion just for a moment. Um, mm-hmm. Because I want to ask you now about love, the central theme, hopefully, that we're going to, that this will run through this podcast. And I want to put psychedelics aside for a second because I want to weave it back in afterwards. Okay, we stopped, talked about emotions. Now we talk psychedelics and emotion. Pause. Love. Okay, psychedelics and love. Okay, maybe psychedelics, love, emotion, person, blah, 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 blah. It might all come together. We'll see. I'll try. <laughs> They've become so fused for right, me, but right. I will do my best to follow these instructions. Okay. Well, you know, it's more, they're more like guideposts. We'll trust the emergent okay. intelligence of the rapport to reveal what it is that we're supposed to be talking about anyways. Um, so why don't we go into this now? What is love? <laughs> Can you give us a definition of love moving forward? Um, at least with respect to how you're framing love in the larger sort of theme of the love project. When I first started committing to the love project, I communicated with some of the people in the field who I regarded as elders or mentors. And Bill Richards was one of those people. I really admired the work he did to not just to rehabilitate, but revitalize the concept of spirituality. Um, and so I communicated with him. And one of the things he said to me is like, one of the problems with love is that it's kind of like the word God. It's incredibly difficult to define. And then I would add, and there's a lot of history and controversy, you know, related to those words. And so I'll be honest, um, part of my desire to move forward with the Love Project, you know, with my colleagues is so that we can put together, informed by people, um, a, a definition of love that is perhaps reflective of where we're at currently. Um, however, there are some amazing definitions of love that are out there. My favorite, I would say, uh, is Thich Nhat Hanh's work. And he talked about four components of love, of true love, actually, are his words. So the first being loving kindness, the second being compassion, um, empathetic joy, and equanimity. And so those variables together make up what he defines as true love. I've been thinking about love using uh, different dimensions also. So uh, four different dimensions, love for or from others um, being two dimensions and others can include nature, can include spirit, um, self-love, and then being love. Uh, which is a a different state that is mostly unique to people with meditation practices or who have had psychedelic experiences. I'm not talking about sexual um, inclinations or sexual urges. Um, I'm talking about the energy that arises that makes it so that you want to open the door for the person coming behind you. You know, um, and that's a really, really narrow definition, but it's, it's a recognition or a remembering that we are all one, um, and that we want to treat each other in a way that promotes uh, health and wholeness, you know, of the collective. I mean, that's another way of thinking about what love is. 
Um, but as I mentioned, like I am really keen to learn more about it. Uh, I want to kind of be a beginner student of love and see where it leads. Um, but it's been a fun process so far to speak to different individuals, you know, who I really admire or respect, who I feel like know so much more than I do and hear them kind of, or see them this kind of scratching their heads too. And be like, yeah, it's a tough one. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like asking think, <clears throat> what the definition of mystery is or like, uh, so what is the mystery? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I would say it's love. <laughs> <laughs> well then what's but God? Yes. It's love. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. So I don't know, but I am really keen to learn more about it because, you know, to your, to your word mystery, love seems to be a very mysterious energy that seems to be a very potent force that to promote healing and growth. And so I think that it needs to be much more present in healing spaces. And that includes psychotherapy, that includes healthcare, like the diabetes clinic or the oncology clinic or the spinal injury clinic, because I think that it is a, it's an uncomfortable topic. It's an unknown topic, but um, it's a very much untapped resource for uh, human flourishing. Mm. Yeah, it definitely got the sense that uh our our society as far as i've grown up in it has a great representation of love except it's always uh it's never actually what you described it's always this weird conflation whether it's like is it infatuation or lust or arousal or obsession or romance like love can certainly be involved in any of these things but none of these things on their own are love or necessarily suggest that love is present um Mm -hmm. and and what i hear you speaking to is is um something like uh something like the love that you're speaking to isn't necessarily an emotion it sounds like what you're speaking to is it's almost like a it's almost like a, a like a meta structure that exists beyond us, you know, in connection with and through which we have this like greater access or capacity to uh, be with each other in joy and in, and in grief in uh, elation and in suffering. Is that kind of what you're, what you're speaking to? Well, I mean, you said it way more eloquently than I could ever. So let me just say that. Uh, But I think that you, you, uh, I mean, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about love being, a deep understanding of another, including of their suffering. And when we have a deep understanding of another, including of their suffering, then love abounds. And the way that we then are with that person, whether we say something or not, whether we do something or not, promotes um, an energy of healing, of flourishing. And so I do think that there's a very mysterious backdrop to all of this, whatever this is that has to do with love. And it's in the space, you know, between us and it's an energy inside of us that scientists, you know, use the word emotion, energy in motion um, to describe. And I imagine that in 10, 20, 50, a hundred years from now, people will have a much clearer, um, definition of what this is but i do feel like it is an object worthy of further study and i don't just mean scientific inquiry i mean like personal collective and all the different spheres and spheres of our lives Mm. this is kind of sassy energy but when you said like it's an object i was like is it an it or is it a thou right but now we're talking about god again (laughs) uh Yeah. Anyway, so that's an aside for those nerds out there that know who Martin Buber is. Uh, Buber, that's how you pronounce his name. Um, Okay. You were delightful, by the way. You were delightful. (laughs) Thank you, Adele. Um, Okay. So let's let's come back to psychedelics. Where do psychedelics come into all of this? Well, I think they can play a role in helping us to remember. Um, that love is a unifying force within ourself, self-love. 
but also with other humans, animals, sentient beings, nature, the planet, the universe, you know, and depending on the person's comfort level, they can start with step one, step two, step three. Um, I did a, I did a talk with Gabor Mate a couple of years ago. And one of the things that he said really, really struck me and I've kept it in my back pocket. He's like, Adele, there are only two types of ceremonies, you know, with psychedelics. I think we were talking about ayahuasca. The ceremony is about love and the ceremony is about what's getting in the way of connecting with that love. And while I feel like it may, there may be, you know, other shades to add to that uh, definition, I have seen that over and again, both in the context of clinical research studies, but outside of the research setting where the psychedelic combined with, well, I shouldn't say that, the psychedelic can open up what's getting in the way of returning to one's true essence, um, self-love, love for others. It can help cultivate that energy. And by the way, love isn't that doesn't mean like there are no boundaries. You know, there's no assertion. Love actually means that you can say no for your sake and for the sake of the other, you know? So I just, I guess I want to clarify that piece. And then when, when we're talking about psychedelic assisted uh, journeys, whether it's assisted by a friend or a guide or a therapist in a study, what I've observed is that the loving presence of the other, like the guide, the friend, the clinician, the loving presence of the other brings up what isn't love in the person who is seeking healing so that together they can move that through. So whether it's like fear that's been trapped in their cells for their life or for their generations, you know, three generations, then we can be in with that fear together. We can honor that fear and help move it through. Or if it's shame for something I did or didn't do, and then I can see the kindness, the compassion, the love in the eyes of my guide who says, yes, tell me about the injury that you inflicted on your friend or your brother or whatever, you know? And then we can move that through so that no longer defines us. And so um, whether we have that automatic experience of remembering love within us as, a, as an effect of the psychedelic medicine, or we're experiencing it in the space between, um, I do believe that that love, that energy, however we want to define it, is what leads to uh, positive outcomes. And in fact, when we look at mystical experiences, I think one of the elements of the mystical experience that I believe is fueling these positive outcomes relates to love, love for all beings, you know, love for self. Something's coming up and I don't know if it's entirely, uh, you know, in the, in the thread of what's happening here, but especially when you mention mystical experiences, I mean, the, the whole cultural narrative right now around psychedelics and mystical experiences, like, well, that's the apex of its helpfulness. Like, oh, that's a little, uh, simplistic, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, is also, is also this, um, I've heard he's a, unfortunately complicated figure now, but quite a long time ago, uh, psychedelic advocate person in the space for 5-MeO, Martin Ball, used the term of 5-MeO DMT, referring it to something like ruthless love, that it just like does not, it, it is it is there and in, engulfing you completely whether or not you want it, you know, and, um, and I'm wondering about experiences of people, you know, opening up that fully and not being able to to feel the love or feeling instead it's absence. And I, I feel like maybe, well, you know, I, I don't it's, go it's ahead. It's interesting that you're bringing yeah. this up actually. Yeah. Okay. Please. Because I had a, uh, legal 5-MeO DMT experience abroad that traumatized me. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I caution people, uh, about those experiences. There was a block inside of me. I imagine, I don't know. Um, but it took me three months to come back from it, from a nervous system uh, perspective. 
And so what you talked, the term that you use, which now escapes me. Ruthless love. Ruthless love, you know, no choice in the matter. I'm like, well, I, I, I would like to work with medicines where um, there is choice, mm. you know, where there's a, there's more, there's more of a relationship. And so uh, I do believe that there's a good, there's going to be a very positive, powerful role for um, 5-MeO DMT. Um, it's not for me. Um, and I, you know, I have some anxieties about it. Um, but, uh, I've heard, I've heard people talk about just being engulfed in love and then now knowing like, okay, this is what this is all about. And then it's completely transformed Mm -hmm. how they treat themselves. I, right. Yes. Yeah. Being love. I mean, that's probably the medicine that most reliably engenders the state of being love, like no boundaries completely i mean i don't even know what word to use engulfed but that doesn't even make sense because then in engulfment there still are boundaries but yeah but it can radically transform how someone um treats themselves treats others but uh radical shifts are not for everybody because we still live in a quite quite a toxic culture where you know we have to find a way to pay our mortgage because we someone's decided that this land is yours or not yours or whatever and so it can be tricky. Mm-hmm. It can be tricky. Sure. I mean, like how, how does I, this is okay. I'm, I'm bottlenecking on a couple of ideas here, but, um, yeah, these, these extreme openings, you know, there's a certain degree of capacity that's required there and it's not necessarily a conscious capacity. And, uh, yeah, like I, I thought of, uh, I think it's Robert Augustus masters, a man whose work I, I deeply value. And he had a very troubling five MEO DNT experience. And he was one of the people that I'm like, wow, I'm surprised by that. He's so open and ready and, and all these things, right? So knowledgeable, right. so compassionate. Um, and yeah, I, I think about that too, like how we are opened on to it, you know, can make a big difference on how it's subjectively received. But I'm also thinking now, what was the other thing that was coming up? Um, oh, come on, working memory. Um, what was the last thing you were mentioning before I started talking? Um, like that it can be too quick of a transformation for some people or some people need to kind of oh, okay, get to it. know love more it. slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was actually your comment about coming back. You know, I've, I've heard, um, a, a term called the post ecstatic blues, you know, when you were talking about like, oh yeah, sometimes our, the world that we're in doesn't actually allow for these experiences to exist as open as our heart yearns them to and we end up coming back to a life where it's like oh this is so far removed from what i just experienced the way i frame it is that like the sort of larger context of your life is so divorced from this experience you had because you existed in a lack of it for so long and and the various factors including your own choices conscious and otherwise led to a scenario where you know, just changing from within is not going to change the external scenario. It's going to take a lot of time and integration process translation from the meaning of your psychedelic experience into the meaning of your regular life. And that could be very upsetting. I've heard a number of people specifically coming back from retreats in the jungle, coming back and being like, it was so beautiful and so perfect. And now it's this again. Yeah. Yeah. My returns from the jungle are always challenging because there's something so natural and freeing and good for my nervous system about being in nature, immersed in nature for 10 days, two weeks, a month, you know, and then coming back home is hard because the definition of home becomes a moving target. Mm. And so it is really important for people to know that psychedelics hold so much promise for flourishing of, of the human population and, and, and its impact on nature and also um the the window of tolerance needs to apply not just within the organism but within the system you know i talk a lot about the impact of psychedelics on family members that can be quite challenging Mm -hmm. the community the society at large you know so i think that there are multiple windows of tolerance that um that we need to think about and consider when we're engaging in um, in our healing work, mm. what is the 
what is the role in love of love in that, Adele? I mean, gosh. I used to, I used to see myself as like, I, my biggest fear was that I was broken beyond repair or bad, like Mm. stained in a way that you like could never be clean, you know? And these were like, um, early, um, what are the, what do we call it in psychology? Oh my gosh. Uh, like early beliefs about oneself, you know, the official name is escaping me. And, um, and so for me, I need the, the self-love was about um, going slowly and surrounding myself with people who I knew wanted the best for me, you know, and taking it one step at a time and isolating <clears throat> myself from others at times until I felt like more steady. And so there was a way that I was loving myself through healing um, by going, you know, perhaps maybe more slowly or more consciously towards feeling, remembering that I am good, you know, I am good and that I am whole. I'm not broken beyond repair. So there's that piece as, as someone who supports people going through these experiences, you know, whether it's supervising clinicians on a trial uh, or in the context of retreats abroad, it's like being really, really, really clear in my motivations fueled by love of humanity, you know, so that um, we can really accept people where they are and really be curious about what's going on for them, what their challenges are uh, stemming from, so that we can then do that for others, if that makes sense. Um, so the love that surrounds is just as important as important, I think, as a, of a healing tool. I did some training with, um, Bruce and Marcela who are, uh, MDMA therapy, um, supervisors, trainers, therapists, amazing, you know, and they really talked about how important it was for them to be grounded in love when they were supporting individuals during the trial. Because that's what they felt was what allowed what wasn't love to emerge, for example, or allowed the healing of early attachment wounds, you know, that, that it was this mysterious, extremely powerful, extremely efficient uh, energy. And so I think that... Um, my hope is that the psychedelic therapy training programs, the research um, community start looking at and talking about and putting into action what we learn about love as a healing force um, with psychedelics. And my greater hope is that that, that translates into the broader community um, where you know, my hope eventually, you know, legal uh, personal use won't be illegal. Mm. I mean, one one immediate challenge that arises for me with respect to what you said about uh, seeing it as a healing force is that I personally believe that in order to really recognize that and lean into it in a way that has it to do the work that it can effectively do, we have to first recognize that it's a healing a healing force that's transpersonal. And right. my sense is that uh, it continues to be the case that most of most, well, I would say personally, from what I know, most of the psychedelic scientists I, I know personally that I've talked to, they're like, yeah, but from the outside, you know, in the larger clinical field, it's like, no, this is an interpersonal thing. And this is between two people. And it's a experience that is occasioned by a pharmacological agent that changes the way the brain works in order to access these emotional states and other hallucinatory effects that have significant personal meaning onto the blah, 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 blah. Right. But to be able to say, like, to embrace love as a healing force and to try to find a way to call that in, into a healing ceremony in, in Mm -hmm. the space itself or a healing session, a therapeutic session into the space itself, Mm -hmm. I think requires a kind of acknowledgement of a, of it, of it being a kind of transpersonal force that I think is very sort of a 
para, paradigmatically challenging or like challenging to the established paradigm. So I, I wonder how yeah. that will go. Well, I have three thoughts about that. Um, the first is uh, a, a woman who had a very longstanding history of serious mental health issues talked to me once about how she saw love in her guide's eyes and was like, what is that? And then realized what it was. And she saw her guide's love for her, her pure love, you know? And she said that that love that she saw became chemically, spiritually metabolized into worthiness, into self-love. So that I thought was like, okay, that's amazing. We need to study that. (laughs) And we need to be interested in that. The other piece is that I think that we all have a geyser of love within us. But if you imagine a geyser and it has tons of boulders over top of it, you know, you might not see it or you might just see a little flick of water. You know, I think that psychedelics offer us the opportunity to permanently remove some of the boulders that are covering up that geyser's upending flow, or it gives us an opportunity to remove all the boulders for a moment. We have that that flow of love with or without anyone else present. So we can have it within ourselves. But the other piece that I wanted to speak to in terms of what you just shared was like, because culturally we are so mixed up in terms of our definition of love, it is risky for us to talk about love in case it is misconstrued. Like I just heard about a practitioner um, in the United States who is having sexual relations with their clients to help them heal from sexual trauma. I mean, that, that is happening all over the place. It's happening all over the place. And I'm like, yeah, no wonder people are a little hesitant to talk about the L word Yeah, because our relate, our understanding of love is many for many of us is tainted, is confused you know, um, and need some cleaning, need some healing. And so when my colleagues say to me, like, oh gosh, like good luck with that, or like worthy effort, we support you. And also, ooh, it's a tough one. You know, I'm like, yeah, I get it. I get it. Um there's a lot going on in the name of love that is not love at all, and that is extremely harmful. And so going slow. And being deliberate, you know, and and having lots of these conversations, not just about the positives of pure love, but the negatives of the misunderstandings related to love, I think is, is just as important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, my, I felt self-aware of how jaded my comment was. And I was like, that's happening all over the place. And it is, it does come from a place of jadedness. Cause I'm like, yeah, I, I am participating in helping uh, put together an, on, an online course right now and it's talking about my role in it is talking about the you know the various dynamics in the various sort of like expressions of relationship in a in a psychedelic session between a guide and a and a, a participant and uh one of the things one of the things that i know i've talked with the other teachers is like kind of sewn throughout the whole thing and i'm going to be very explicitly it's like do not have sex with your clients at no point in any circumstance is it ever appropriate for you to have sex with your clients or any sort of sexual touch actually right. yeah or yes but any, there, any there, sexual touch any there are any healing Im- modalities yeah, that are yeah. embracing this as a form so i don't you know and so i maybe i'm naive i'm uninformed i need to learn more about it but from where i stand given my experiences i completely agree with you mm. yeah i mean is it is it the case that there can be healing modalities where sex and sexual touch can have positive, powerful, beautiful effects on people? Probably. I've I've heard many actual very positive stories of people receiving mm-hmm. sort of like tantric types of therapy in containers that felt very safe and very positive and very like non-abusive and came out the other end feeling very positive about it. So this is not to say that that isn't yeah. possible. It's more just something along the lines of like, when it comes to working with psychedelics in this therapeutic context, it becomes so muddy and so easy for so much transference and projection and things to arise and all of these other things. It's just like, it's better yeah. as just like the basic standard, just don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I feel like you have to be like a Jedi with your own mm. 
internal world to be able to facilitate the kinds of healing experiences that you're referring to. Because I've also heard from people who initially thought that those psychedelic experiences of sexual exploration and healing were beautiful, wonderful, consensual. And then six months later, they're like, wait a minute. Actually, that part didn't feel good. And I didn't have awareness to it. So I I kind of, I'm not uh, well-versed in that area. I'm the first to say it. Um, And so I really can't speak to it um, super intelligently. But I can say like, for people who are considering those types of healing practices, like to tread very cautiously, ask lots of questions, but there's another, there's a flip side to what you just shared uh, actually that I was hoping to comment on. Like I was speaking to a ketamine provider and uh, a male uh, identifying ketamine provider who shared with me that um, they made sure that they were never alone with a, um, with a, a female identifying individual in a ketamine space. And at first I was like, Oh yeah, that's great. That's great. But then I remembered, um, when I was younger, this is might be too, too much information, but going for an annual physical, which included a gynecological exam. Mm-hmm. And it was a, it was a male physician. He said, Oh, I'll bring the nurse in for your comfort. And I remember feeling like, Oh, I wasn't actually, I was, I was okay with it. Being, I didn't know I was unsafe with you. Right. And yeah. so then when I was speaking to that ketamine provider, I pressed a little bit. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, what if they tell you, actually, I feel completely safe with you. I feel completely safe and I trust you and my instincts feel really clear. What would you do then? And he said, well, I would still have uh, someone else present in the room. And I thought, okay. So it's not about you wanting to create safety for the other person. It's about you wanting to protect yourself. Now, in some um, respect, that's that's not unreasonable because in a psychedelic right. space, the person in the psych, this is why, you know, I mentioned the sexual therapy type stuff as being its own thing. I mean, once it's mixing with psychedelics, it's like, oh, okay, hold on now. <laughs> it's totally, just gotten but too complex. The, thing, the problem though is making it seem like it's for the other person's safety as opposed to being clear about the real reason. Yeah. See, right? because, because the, it, the it is fair to say like, no, from my perspective, it, it makes me feel more safe because yes. there's all sorts of things that can happen that could lead to the perception of things happening that aren't or actually that I happening. With. Yeah. And that, or that I need help with and having another person in the room to be like, yep, yes. that's why all those uh, MDMA sessions with maps are recorded. Right. I mean, for research purposes, but from what I understand, it's enabled to go back and be like, mm-hmm. were there any violations of ethical conduct here? For example, the stuff that came up with um, Megan. 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 Yeah. Was that's that's a uh, uh, Richard Jensen? That was his mm-hmm. client, right? So, mm-hmm. so for those mm-hmm. things weren't recorded. I mean, it's yeah. They said they yeah, said. Yeah, I just thing. I just feel like it's uh, it's it's injurious to the participant if we're pretending that. Yes. It's for their safety and comfort if that's not something that they feel that they need. And rather, it opens up this possibility, you know, to have these conversations about like, yeah, psychedelics can be unpredictable. And I would say, and I as a practitioner am not, um, like, have not experienced all of the possibilities that may arise and I might need help. I might need support, you know, so it's not about the other person being problematic. It's about like, yeah, we're just learning about this, you know, and one, one of the questions I have for guys is like how much training they get in even just working with love in the space, forget about sexual urges or sexual behaviors, you know, um, like we need, we need to talk and learn, teach more about how to handle what emerges, um, so that it can promote healing and growth. Mm. It's a good topic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're doing a research project on it. Um, okay. So let's, let me ask this question then. All right. So s- psychedelic therapy, sexual therapy, psychedelic therapy, sex, psych- sexual therapy, psychedelics, probably not a good mix. Fair to say, almost probably definitely hundred percent, not a good mix. Um, however, 
their psychedelic use exists well outside of therapeutic dynamics and the you know the the relational circumstances the relational dynamics um within which psychedelics are being explored you know there are certain contexts where it's entirely appropriate for sexual oh interaction gosh, to be shared sure. right so what about sex and psychedelics we're not talking about therapy obviously we've discussed the, how problematic that is but specifically between two established consenting adults you know that this is they're going to take psychedelics and make love what what are your what's your thoughts on that well maybe i'll just back it up for a second and talk about the role of psychedelics in healing um bringing healing to our idea of sex our relationship with sex flexibility with sexual identity. You know, I think that there's, I mean, gosh, one of my, um, friends from, uh, from Arizona did her dissertation on the role of psychedelics and, um, sexuality, I believe in women, although I'm not, I'm not remembering exactly that I'll provide the information if you want to include it in the show notes. And I mean, it was, the results were beautiful, you know? So I think psychedelics can play a really significant role uh, for individuals, whether uh, solo or with their trusted um, partners to uh, disentangle the impact of historical trauma, of sexual trauma, of the influence of patriarchy, you know, on sexual health in, in all people. Um, so I think that's, very, very promising. Now, the idea of having sex with a partner, um, there are so many anecdotal and now some research reports that are indicating that it can be a really beautiful tool to reconnect people to themselves and then to others in that order, you know, and, and sometimes it's happening in real time. It's not an area that I know a lot about clinically or research-wise or even personally. So I don't have a lot to offer except to say that there is promise and potential and that there are pitfalls. If things go wrong in that kind of experience, the impact is greater than if there weren't a psychedelic on board. Um, so that's number one, you know, because it's a nonspecific amplifier, it can be much more harmful or damaging if things go wrong um, and you're altered. And a thing go wrong could be a small thing, you know, or it can be a significant thing. Um, the other piece is that in my years of supporting people therapeutically with and without psychedelics, the two... Um, early experiences that I've seen are the hardest to heal from are adoption and sexual trauma. And so I think, I think that it's very possible to have really, really beautiful healing, spiritual, sacred experiences with sex and psychedelics. And we have to be really careful. Yeah. The, 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 the container of the relationship it's it can't just it has to have a certain sort of integrity to it which has a great capacity for depth and for breadth and a yeah. lot of uh you know a lot of i'd say conversation and discussion in advance i mean it, oh, i'm just thinking about a guy who was significantly malaligned like later turned out to be uh, a systematic abuser as a as a therapist or a, a predator we'll say uh his oh. he, he was from an organization called like a interchange or something it was like a big big uh fallout several years ago um yes turns out he was uh treating people very very badly and was not i'm like trying i'm trying to find a way to describe how awful what he did was without characterizing him as, as a monster because that gets really complicated but either way, trying to differentiate how how he used his knowledge from some of the knowledge that he shared, because some of the knowledge that he shared was really incredible. And one of the things he brought up was this idea of like the other safe sex conversation. The first one is like, oh, yeah, how many partners have you had? You know, like how, when was the last time you were recently tested? You know, like this kind of one. Mm -hmm. And the other safe sex conversation being something like, well, what does this mean for you? 
what might come up? Like what has historically come up? Like, is there anything that, you know, like you're look, what are you wanting out of this? What are you afraid might come of this? Like these types of conversations before you have this kind of interaction with somebody. And fair enough, we exist in a society where sex is like, it's like a pinnacle of focus. And it's also simultaneously a thing that we want to talk about the least, you know, and, and existing in this like weird balance. But the, that sort of like other safe sex conversation, this sort yeah. of like added level of really flushing out, like all the possible things that might come up and why and what it's all for in order to really assess, like, does this feel safe and positive for you to be exploring with your partner at this time or whoever it might be? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sex was also a system of oppression. Mm, yeah, you know, yeah. so it's when we're using something that you that has been and continues to be a system of oppression to heal, like you have to be a Jedi master, I think, you know, and like, or be really, really brave uh, um, within the container that you described of, of safety. But I mean, I am like, junior kindergarten preschool when it comes to all of this i have a long ways to go to heal from the impact of uh, patriarchal influence but also uh, what, what i experienced in my life as uh as a woman before i'll ever go into that territory like oh my gosh like I've had experiences where during on the effect of a psychedelic you know someone said that they would be there to hold my hand and they were like five minutes late and I was like, so struggling with that, you know, I mean, I'm just, it's just not in my future anytime soon, um, to, to be doing that, but that's me, you know, like I have, I'm first to admit that I have a lot of healing work to do still in that arena, but I don't think I'm alone. I don't think I'm alone. Um, so I might suggest to people if they were thinking about doing that to do a solo journey, to really kind of ask oneself, like, why? Why am I interested in doing this? And then really having the opportunity to scan inside and outside, like, okay, are there any potential red flags or yellow flags? Is it all a green flag 100%? If not, what do, what is needed in order to get there? And you don't need to do a psychedelic journey for that, but you know, you get more access to more information that way, to a therapist or a friend or whatever. Um, but I, I do believe that some prep work would be really important. Um, to protect people from getting in situations where they couldn't have predicted that, oh, this misstep under normal circumstances wouldn't have been so wounding or wounding at all. But under these circumstances, with this level of sense sensitivity, you know, especially psychological sensitivity, uh, but also physical sensitivity, that it's a different story. Mm-hmm. I mean, add to that also that you've that those explorations include conversations with your partner, you know, that you've had yeah, sex oh, yeah. with that person before <laughs> at least once, you know, and that you yeah. may be taking psychedelics with that person before sans sexual interaction, I mean, like, you know, that the, you kind of yeah. have like a, a good general terrain before you start sort of stacking, you know, experiences of profound energetic in te- intensity on top of each other relationships on their own are already, you know, energetically intense oh containers, right? Like minus all of these other factors. Like this yeah. part of the conversation is like, I have so much anxiety. I'm like, no one should listen to anything I have to say about, about the, cause like maybe the cautions. Yes. But the other piece, because I, I'm just like, I just really am nervous about it. I just finished writing a paper with colleagues, uh, the good, bad, the ugly of ayahuasca, you know, like look, really hearing what, when it went wrong or what can go wrong. And so I'm really nervous. And I'm, and I know that I have colleagues in the space who are taking on this topic with enthusiasm and, um, and I'm really grateful, you know, for them, uh, for doing this, but I don't know. I'm kind of like, I'm still like the scared little girl when it comes to this. And I believe that some of it is influenced by my own unhealed wounds, but I also believe that some of it is influenced by my understanding of, uh, historical trauma mm-hmm. and how it has become intertwined with sexual relations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I can appreciate that both in the sense of like, I feel like I have an appreciation for your feelings, but also appreciate in the sense of like feeling grateful that you're sharing them. Um, mm-hmm. and you know, my perspective, you know, I'm seeing these things and I'm also in a, you know, multi-year long standing intimate relationship that is like 
in a very healthy, positive place. And right. our explorations in that respect have been like, ex- well, I mean, there have been challenges. There are challenges in any psychedelic experience, any relationship, but they have been systematically and progressively posititive and contributing to the integrity of our relationship. So I have that. Oh my God. That's the things too. Counterpoint. Right? Thank you. It's, <laughs> It's also healing for me to hear that, you know, so that is wonderful. And thank you for sharing that because it does provide for a more balanced, you know, uh, viewpoint because I am not in your situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, So thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's, let's start to come to a close here. Um, Yes. Oh my God. Thank God. (laughs) (laughs) You're you're out of the hot seat. Uh, Almost anyways. Um, The love project. I want to know a little bit about a little bit more about this. I mean, understandably, I think uh, some aspect. Uh, how do I bring this question? And there's something about the potential of this entire conversation having primed people uh, to right. how they perceive things. So maybe weave that in too. But tell me a little bit more about the Love Project, um, its various aspects, and what you're intending to achieve with it. Yeah. So, um, so as I mentioned, I was trained as a psychologist. And, um, one of the earliest teachings as a psychologist, when we were learning about psychotherapy were the elements critical to positive outcome. And one of those elements was coined by a very famous psychologist and the, the, it's called unconditional positive regard. And so, um, psychologists grow up learning about unconditional positive regard and its importance. Well, um, I, I had a psychedelic journey and, uh, three, a little over three years ago. And the whole journey was about love. And I just had this like deep feeling and knowing that it's a topic that I should address globally, but more specifically for the arenas of psychotherapy and healthcare. So, um, Unconditional positive regard, I think, is a euphemism for love. I think that Carl Rogers did not feel safe at the time speaking of love because he was already so controversial with this notion of unconditional positive regard in the times of um, behaviorism and psychoanalysis, for example, right? And so I feel like it's probably time now for us to be able to evolve the conversation from unconditional positive regard to what I think, you know, as I mentioned, what he was really talking about was love, this universal love um, that seems to create the conditions where growth, healing and growth are most um, possible. The other piece was um, the blank slate. So Freud and psychoanalysis really kind of talked about the importance of the blank slate for psychoanalysis because it's all about transference, right? So the blank slate makes a lot of sense in that setting, um, the, the therapist being really neutral. But I think what people are confused about now is that unless you're doing psychoanalysis, which, by the way, is a very privileged form of psychotherapy because it requires, you know, 60 to 90 years. minutes, four to five <laughs> times a week for years, yeah, right? Yeah we're not doing psychoanalysis. Like community mental health agencies are not doing psychoanalysis. And so this idea of the blank slate actually doesn't make sense. Theoretically, it doesn't make sense psychologically. And so then we want to turn to, okay, what does make sense? Can I just pause for a second? It also yes. doesn't make sense physiologically. The The right. response of flat facial affect in moments of emoting is very abandoning. It's in, injurious onto yes, the person, you know, or can be. Yeah. So I think yeah. that uh, I just want to like add that into physiologically. There's a response to reaching out emotionally and getting nothing. Yeah. 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 And I mean, I did, I did do psychoanalysis for a year, you know, on the couch and I I did feel the love of my therapist. And so I felt like the nuance of that, Mm. but in everyday mental health settings, we are not doing psychoanalysis. And so the blank slate doesn't make sense for all kinds of reasons. And so let's be informed by unconditional positive regard. Let's be informed by love and, and do it in a way where we can feel more comfortable talking about that of which we are referring to, you know, this universal love that is clear, that is ethical, that is boundaried. Um, and then in healthcare, 
You know, I recently interviewed uh, some individuals who suffered spinal cord injuries, and I asked them about the role of love in their healing. And, you know, they had some pretty incredible things to say about the role of love, whether it was a nurse or a psychedelic guide who supported them, you know, in, in their healing journey. And so, and in, but in all kinds of departments, like in the hospital, you know, like the cancer department, or, uh, uh, diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like love is an underutilized healing energy. So that was that ceremony, the ceremony, like it's almost like a mission, you know, like you must do scientific research that will be respected by your peers on a difficult topic. And the topic of love so that we can learn from psychedelic experiences of love to inform the evolution of psychotherapy and healthcare and beyond. But if I'm being honest, the ceremony was about helping to transform the landscape of love in psychotherapy and healthcare. So it took a while, but I found other people who were just as committed and interested um, in doing the same. So Ann Wagner, Maris Williams, Paul Uy, uh, myself, Aaron Strand, and uh, a number of volunteer um, volunteers as well. And we put together a survey study. Roland Griffiths helped, shared his tool. Um, Tony um, from NYU shared his tool, you know, consulted with Bill Richards, uh, others who helped us to put it together. Robin Carhart Harris also shared with one of his tools. So just really grateful to all of those people and others. And we put together a survey, we got research ethics approval, and it's all about psychedelic experiences of love, profound psychedelic experiences of love, so that we can learn from them, so that we can put together a working definition, so that we can look to see, okay, what was the impact of these experiences, if any? What does the person completing the survey think about more of a focus of love and psychotherapy and healthcare, you know? And to your point, you know, listening to this podcast might have primed a person in an interaction or another, but I think that's okay because our research question is not, can love be healing? We know that it can be healing, but there's a lot more that we don't know. Um, And so we are seeking individuals who have had profound experiences of love to share with us their experiences, both in content, but also in terms of like how it felt in their body and what did they notice happened in their lives with their friends, you know, with their family, et cetera. What are their thoughts about the potential, but also the risks of talking about love uh, more explicitly in the context of therapy, healthcare and beyond. And so, you know, yeah, just really hoping that if people are interested in broadening the conversation, deepening the conversation, but also helping us to learn that they will consider filling out this 30 minute survey. Wonderful. Uh, I'll make sure links to that are in the show notes to this episode. Um, and, uh, which is always at jameswjesso.com or, uh, you know, linked over in whatever pod catcher you're, you're listening to this show on or YouTube. Um, sorry, a little, almost like fourth wall break there for a second. Um, that said, Adele, thank you so much uh, for the work that you're putting in for uh, everyone's favorite unconditional positive regard, <coughs> love, um, <laughs> but uh, but also generally into into the world um, and into the psychedelic space as well. And for your time today, I really appreciated it. Thank you, James. I'm yeah, it was a real delight. I can't believe it took this long for us to be able to have a, this kind of conversation. And yeah, I just really appreciate uh, the opportunity and cut. Okay, so that's all for this interview of Adventures to the Mind. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you'd like to participate in the survey, uh, the Love Project survey, it is still open for the next couple of weeks from the time of this release. So do jump over to psychedeliclove.org to uh, participate in the survey. There's more information about it there uh, if you'd like to learn more. And uh, follow up with uh, Dr. LaFrance. Uh, her work is beautiful, and I'm, I'm very uh, excited to have the opportunity to support that work here through the show. If you'd like to support the show itself, uh, doing so financially would be wonderful. Thank you in advance. You can do so by Patreon or through a one-time donation, such as through PayPal. 
Uh, links uh, to do so and some other options are in the description to this episode wherever you're checking out. Non-financial ways of support also include, of course, sharing the show um, or just signing up as a member, a, a non-paying member of Patreon is a way to follow me. Um, and if you'd like to just generally follow the show, which is a nice way to support it, you can sign up for my newsletter, my Telegram group, or again, sign up for uh, as a non-paying member of the Patreon. Uh, links for all of that are included in the show notes to this episode or in the description to this episode, as well as the show notes at jameswgesso.com. And I thank you very much for tuning in all the way to the end. And until the next episode, take care.